I've actually put a lot of my friends onto therapy and there were quite a few of them were people who had not had no idea about therapy they really thought it was going to be a sit down conversation tell me about your problems that is not my experience of therapy it's so much more light than that it's not it doesn't have to be a heavy experience so a lot of the time it's like it's explaining that it doesn't need to be something which is you don't also you don't need to have a traumatic event in your life in my opinion to have therapy a lot of the time like I've got a friend who hasn't had really anything I mean we all have our own stuff but hasn't had anything on paper which is traumatic yet she has got so much out of therapy so and that's really telling Hello, I'm Dr. Sherry Jacobson, and this is Therapy Lab, a podcast dedicated to therapy, thought, and the art of mental well being. In this episode, we are joined by singer songwriter Amber Donozo. I'm looking forward to catching up with Amber and finding out more about her life, work, and experiences of therapy. Hello, Amber, and welcome. Hello. Thank you very much. How are you? Good, thank you. That was my Good. first question to you, <laughs> to do a quick well-being check with a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the lowest mood, 10 being the highest. How are you today? I'm probably on a solid 8. The, the remaining 2 is because I'm a bit tired. I've been working a lot, but I'm feeling really good today. The weather hasn't affected me, which is kind of funny because normally I find if it's raining and it's dark, my mood can get a bit down, but I'm actually all right. Yeah, it is a miserable t day today. Yeah. So luckily, we're we're ensconced in, indoors, um, but we'll get okay. to we'll we'll get to uh, your busy workload in a little <laughs> bit. Tell me a little bit about, um, if you can, about your your work, what you're doing presently. So I'm a singer, a singer songwriter. Um, I started playing the guitar when I was really young, when I was ten, and then started singing literally a few months afterwards then started songwriting and kind of ever since then I went to a performing arts school and then just been working on my music career. I finished studying and then yeah, just been kind of getting all of my songs together, working with producers. I'm off to Miami next month, which I'm so excited about to record out there. So yeah, I'm really, yeah, I'm excited. I think this year is gonna be a really good year. So I'm feeling good. And how did you know that this was a career that you wanted to go into? Was it very clear early on and how yeah. were you able to stick with that? I was so lucky because it was actually due to circumstance that I started with music because I don't come from a musical family at all. So, um, yeah, I literally, there was a certain event that happened in my family, which was very traumatic for me as a child, and music was my escape. Um, so as soon as I started playing the guitar, I was like, it was so natural to me. It felt like I'd been doing it my entire life. I was just like, this is this is what I need to do and it was freeing for me and it made other people feel good as well so I was like this is what I want to do I want to have a good effect in the world in any way I can do so yeah and so presently you are you overworked what are what, what are some of the challenges that you're you're going through I think um that's a good question I work in an industry which um is very very difficult and very harsh um and I'm a very sensitive soul, so at times I find it overwhelming. I've also suffered with anxiety in my entire life, so, and I'm a massive empath. So when I walk into a room, I can kind of take on everyone's energy within a millisecond. So sometimes that can be difficult for me, especially if I'm at a show and I'm about to get on stage and it's hectic. I kind of take all of it on and then it can end up overwhelming me. And then the show will be great, but then I'll come off stage and I'm like, wow, I feel really tired. Um, but I think anyone in the music industry would probably tell you the same thing. It's a very, very difficult and harsh industry to be in. Mm. And yeah. can you start to explain a little bit of some of the coping strategies that you yeah. use to get through episodes of anxiety and em empathically taking on so much of other people's yeah. energy and mood? Uh, one of, and I've said this for years, my biggest one is therapy because I've had it for such a long time. It's been such an important part of my life. I really don't think I'd be the person I am today unless I had the therapy. It kind of saved me in the, in the least dramatic way, but it really did. Um, another coping mechanism is I have a really close relationship with my mum and she's incredible and I really look up to her. So just communicating with her. I'm one of those people, if I speak my feelings it, and just put it out into the world, it kind of releases it for me. 
I can't bottle things in. So that's another one. And another thing is my cat. <laughs> and anyone who follows what I do knows that I'm in love with my cat, but I find him so healing. Um, and yeah, I love, I just love being around animals, mm. so yeah. Have you always enjoyed it, being around animals? Is that something yeah. that you knew was therapeutic for you? Yeah, I mean, I grew up, my dad was a sportsman and it, it was around horses. So I was always around horses or dogs or cats and I've always had such a connection with them. So, I mean, my, my cat, which I have currently now, I've had him for 14 years, but it's a bit of a crazy story because we had to give him away five years ago. And I was manifesting my cat back into my life. I was just like, I really need an animal in my life right now. No joke, phone call, Amber, your cat has been found on the road. Can you please come up and pick him up? I was like, my cat, who I adored my entire life, and now he's been with me for two years. So he was always meant to come back home to me, so I love him, yeah. So you have many therapeutic outlets yeah. in a way. Tell me a little bit about the role that music p plays for you yeah. in, 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 as a therapeutic yeah. tool. It's really funny because when I first started, I found it a soul healing. Like I really, I would sing and I still find this now, I will sing and it just like, it's just like healing for me. But when you make it into more of a career, there's a whole other load of baggage which comes with it, which is like any career. So that's why I find it so important that with whatever you do for your work, that you love it because you're gonna have all the other baggage come on as well. Um, but yeah, it's been, I, I, I find music incredibly healing. I love working with creative people. I've been so lucky to work with some incredible producers. My creative director, Michelle Deverney, is unreal. And yeah, I just like, I love music. And I love dancing and performing. That's, being on stage is my thing. Like it always has been. So yeah, I'm very lucky to do what I and love. And for someone who suffers from anxiety, who who, who has had anxiety to, yeah. to contend with, yeah. how do you square that with a very performance-based Crazy, side? it's really yeah. crazy because I've chosen, and it's, I, I really believe it's for, it's part of my purpose on, of being on earth. I've chosen one career choice, which is fully challenging my anxiety. It's like, I've chosen the career to put myself on stage in front of thousands of people to be judged. Yeah, I'm su someone who suffers with anxiety. Um, and for me, I see it as a bigger picture. It's like I've chosen that career, number one, because I love it. But number two, in order for me to conquer that fear and, and conquer the anxiety. Have I conquered it? No. Am I definitely further than I was 10 years ago? Absolutely. But it's a, it's a journey for me. Yeah. And you're, in, you're in, in an industry which is known for being quite cutthroat. And yeah. what are some of the challenges that you've faced so far? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, one of the biggest challenges I've found is being a woman in the industry. Um, and this is something I really want to change. And I'm fortunate, I'm so young, that I have a long time to try and maneuver my way through and try and change it for the better. Um, but it's been really tough <clears throat> as a woman. I think partially because I work in a little bit of the urban side, like I'm a more of an urban pop artist. So I work with a lot of the urban guys who are incredibly talented and lovely people, but it's very male dominated. There aren't many women really kind of about, especially all of the, I've never worked with one female producer. And that says something because I've worked with quite a lot of people. So on one side, it's been brilliant because I'm kind of one of the boys. Like when I'm in the studio, it's like I'm cool with everyone, but I'm also a woman. And, you know, we are different, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, it's been tough, but it's something which is one of my missions in my lifetime is to try and change it for the better, for it to be equal. So, yeah. Mm. And tell us a little bit about pressures in general, being in the music industry and particularly image based ones. And of yeah. course, you've had some experience in the fashion world as yeah. well. Yeah, it's really funny because when I modeled for a few years, I started when I was 16 and I modeled until I was around 18. Um, and I really did it properly. I was in Paris and it was brilliant. It was a wonderful experience. I only ever did it for money for my music. So that was a difference. It wasn't like modeling was my goal. I always had the perspective of this is part of a bigger purpose. Um, and I found it difficult being solely judged on what I looked like. Every time I walked into a room, it wasn't like, how are you, Amber? It's more like, let me look at your face. Let me look at your body. Let me see your measurements. And that was difficult for me initially. 
but the music industry has been twice as hard. So, and this was shocking for me because I really thought being in an industry which is solely about what I look like could be soul destroying. But I found it was a lot more difficult in the music industry because not only are they looking at what I look like, they're looking at what I sound like, what, how I write my music, uh, how I dance, how I present myself in an interview, what I dress like. There's so much more which I'm being judged on that, um, yeah, it was funny for me. But I really, I feel blessed that I had the modeling experience because it really made me thick skin to go into the music industry. So yeah. yeah. And how have you coped with the, uh, the number of criticisms or critiquing eyes? Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, I think growing up, my mum always instilled it. Like, it was always very clear to me. It was one of the things she repeated to me a lot when I was younger. What someone thinks of you is a reflection of themselves. And I always had this at the front of my mind. I always, like... In ther it was one of the things I actually learned in therapy is having like a mirror in front of me and whatever someone says to me, they're actually talking to themselves. And it was something which was so important for me to learn because even in, in myself, like if I call someone beautiful, I have to know what it feels like to be beautiful, to call them beautiful. So it was, I used that in the same, that same technique when someone was critiquing me. I was like, this is really not about me. And... I deal with it in a like a loving and kind way because I'm just like you must be hurting to say something like that and I know because I you know I'm human as well I've done I've done my bit in the past and whenever I've said something which I didn't mean it was because I was in a bad place it had nothing to do with them mm. yeah. you're so self-aware and I'd love to find out a little bit more about the roots of that if we yeah. can go back to your childhood yeah. what were your early experiences growing up yeah, um, so as I said, if I go way back, I was always very anxious and I was always a very sensitive kid. I hated school, hated school. I didn't feel like I fitted in. I was bullied as a child um, and I went to a very academic school. So I just was completely singled out by the teachers and the students. So that was tough for me. I was also very, very dyslexic in a really academic school. So it was, yeah, it was difficult. So at, at the time, one of my mum's best friends was a brilliant therapist. So I would have like an on and off session, probably like once every six, seven, eight months and just talk to her. I was, I was very young. I must have been like seven years old. And it was really great for me because it was like just talking to another woman about my experiences. And she helped me give like she gave me tools to be able to deal with it. And then I lost my father when I was 10 and he was my bestest friend. He was everything to me. And that was so, so heartbreaking for me. Um, and it was really tough. And I, I remember at the time, to be honest with you, I, I was in the UK and my grandpa had just died in the UK. And then I got a phone call that my dad had an accident. So I went back to Chile, which I was just, well, it was Argentina. Um, and I just remember it was difficult because I was 10. I wasn't mature enough. My brain hadn't developed to understand that that had actually happened so I could see my dad like I could see him in the hospital which was very traumatic for me I'm not gonna lie um, but I couldn't incorporate it and properly understand that he had died after he died so I kind of spent years really years thinking he was gonna come back and that was heartbreaking for me but um, my mom was so strong my sister was incredible we are like that like they really are my bestest friends. Um, and I started having therapy and my mum was so, she was so amazing with how she dealt with it because I really don't know how she did it. I have so much respect and admiration for my mum um, because she, I mean, at that moment, what do you do? You've got two kids, you're a single mum now. What do you do? Like, how do you, how do you cope? Um, so she asked a few people, she was just like, how can I try and heal my children through this experience? And someone recommended a child coach, uh, like a child therapy coach. Um, and I remember I, we had, I think, a few sessions. I was really into it. I was really into it because I'd had a few sessions before and it was always something, as I said, I was very sensitive and I was a big empath ever since I was tiny. So I was really into talking about my feelings. Um, so yeah, so then 
that's kind of how it started. And then I got onto the proper road of therapy. And I was like, this is, this is it for me. I love it. Yeah. Mm. So early experiences of therapy talking, yeah. it felt quite natural. Do you yeah. remember the kinds of approach that your therapist took with you? Was it more so, supportive or directive? Yeah. So initially, um, I had a few different therapists. I knew a few different therapists through my mum, but they were different types of therapists. Um, I remember when I was very young, I think I was around 14, I specifically asked to have a male therapist because I was dealing with a female therapist, yet I was dealing with specific male issues. And a lot of the fear I had was around men. So me talking about it with a woman was so safe for me that it was almost like I'm not really dealing with the issue here. I feel like I need to dive myself into the deep end here and talk about this with a guy, which was my biggest fear. I didn't want to expose myself. I didn't want to put myself in a vulnerable position with a man again. Um, due to, I mean, it was due to losing my dad. I'd, I was so heartbroken and felt abandoned by a male that I associated it with all males, that it was like, I don't want to have anything to do with it, any more males because they let me down. That was my view on it. So by me having a male therapist, forced me to have to break that because I had to sit there and tell him how I felt about a male who let me down in my life not that do you see what I mean it wasn't that he actually let me down but could it went down as abandonment as a child um but I was very careful with who I went to go and see because I specifically wanted to see someone who someone else had had an experience with so I felt like I could trust the therapist because there are in my opinion there's a lot of therapists out there and if I, if I know someone who's had a good experience with someone, I'd prefer to try them first. Um, so I remember I was seeing someone who was recommended through a friend and he was brilliant. And then I felt like I naturally evolved into seeing a woman at the time who was my therapist for, I think, a year. And then I ended up with my therapist who I've been seeing for six years now or so, who is incredible. Mm, how would so you describe happy. his personality and style? He... Um, the reason why I love his how he approaches things is because he comes from a seriously spiritual background and I'm very spiritual. So it's about incorporating like your spiritual self, your mental self, your body, everything. And that's why I really liked it, because for me, it's so much more than just your mental situation. Like it's everything together. How do you take care of yourself? What's your well-being like? And that will have a reflection on how your head works, how you feel. And have you been able to connect with your therapist when you have been abroad? Yeah, so we do it over Skype. It's, it's funny because I'm one of those people as well. Like, I know what I need in order to... I'm not... This is another thing is people have sometimes said to me, am I fully reliant on my therapist? Such a good question. I'm not. And I, and I think that's a healthy thing because I can function without my therapist. And that's a healthy balance between him and I. It's It's partially on my side and it's partially on his side how he's portrayed himself in in my life um but it's definitely something which adds goodness in my life so I definitely like to bring it through with me but like my vocal coach my therapist I just do over Skype once a week both of them doesn't matter where I am and how would you compare the difference between meeting them in person versus yeah. having the session remotely I'm very much an in-person person, like because as I said, I always speak about energy. I can really do the work. I really find if it's in person, but if because I've had therapy with my therapist for so long now, it's been six years. I don't feel like I need. To, it's it's crucial for me to have it in person every single time. I mean, if I'm away, then I do it on Skype, and then when I'm back, I do it in person. Um, but definitely, I think in the earlier stages, like if you're new to therapy, it's definitely better to do it in person. In my experience, it's just my, yeah, my opinion. Mm -hmm. And what would you say is his role now that you've been working together for such a long period of time and you have covered a number of techniques and tools? What would you say is the added value that you gain from, from connecting with him? It's just like it quietens down that voice in my head. It's, as I said, I'm also dealing with a lot of anxiety and my work adds a lot of anxiety to my life. So me just being able to have 30 minutes or an hour just talking to someone who has no emotional involvement in what I'm doing, because that can also be, that's a different conversation with someone. If I'm speaking to my mum, who I adore, 
she's going to be talking as my mum. My therapist has no like kind of baggage, I guess, involved in what I'm doing. So that's really nice for me because I'll just be like, listen, this is a situation. What do you think? Are there any tools that you can help me with this? And that's just basically how I just move forward. And I've progressed so much so much in my day-to-day -day life so yeah I'm really mm. lucky and you do chronologue that on your social media and I yeah. think you're very candid in Thank with you. your audience and conversation and I value it as a, as a viewer and listener Thank and you. I wonder what is your relationship like with social media yeah it's been it's been one which has evolved because I've had it I mean I started Instagram in 2013 and my page then I mean I was still I was partying I was having fun I I was still very aware, I was having therapy still at that time, but I was still very aware what was going on, but I wasn't adding value as to how can I help the world through my Instagram or through what I'm doing. So it's only been in the past probably two, three years where I will sit down, no makeup, because I want I want it to be an, a proper conversation. It's not what it's not about what I look like or what I'm wearing, and just talk to people on a real level. Um, and I'm so ha I'm so open to just be like, listen, this is my experience. And some people will be shocked to be like, wow, she is so open. Like, how has she got no barriers that? And it's because, I mean, like, we all go through stuff. We're all going through something. Like, we don't need to hide ourselves in order to feel accepted. And I just feel like if I can add, if I can change one person's day through my social media, that is massive for me. And it's it's something which I'm incorporating through my music, how I write my songs. I want to help fe like people feel good. When I'm on stage, my energy, I want to make fe people yeah. feel good. And then just through just just a conversation with people. Yeah. yeah. And you're a real giver. And Thank I wonder you. if ever it feels draining for you to be on social media. Do you feel you need to regulate your use of it? Or yeah. is it actually energizing for you? If I'm honest, mm -hmm. definitely not energizing. Definitely not. I find it very tiring, um, but it's part of what I do. It's part of my work. It's kind of one of the categories which makes up of my day-to-day -day work life. Um, when I do find that energizing is when I get amazing feedback. And it's been, I've, if I'm honest, I think in the past year, especially last year, when because I, I was expressing on social media when I was sick as well. And that was big for me because it was, I was having surgery. I was so unwell. But I was saying to the camera, listen, this is what's going on. And that was difficult for me because it was like at my very, very, very low, I was still telling people what was happening. But then I would have people messaging me being like, thank you so much. Like, thank you so much. I've been going through something like this. Or I know someone who's going through something like this and you've been able to sh show me something so I can try and help them. And that is what is so giving for me. And yeah, I just, I feel blessed and thankful that I'm able to impact anyone's life in a, in a positive and good way. So your vulnerability is a gift to others in a way. Yeah and a lot of people are scared about that and I can see that but I find that as one of my powers it's one of my things where I will put myself on the platform and be vulnerable and maybe half of the people will tear me down for it but the other half or maybe one person in that crowd will be like you saved me and that is enough for me. That is just that one person. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And then in general, like being, being young, uh, as we yeah. know is associated with increasing mental health issues in the younger generation. Yeah. Um, many of them are digitally, many of their issues are digitally related, yeah. but also perhaps in terms of career, you were very lucky you had an early sense of what you wanted to yeah. do. For those who are feeling lost yeah. and undirected, do you have any ad advice to I give? I definitely do, yeah. because I've spoken about this with a lot of my friends. Um, as I said, I was so fortunate and I was so lucky. That's not normal. You, at 10 years old, you don't know what you, every, pretty much everyone doesn't know what they want to do at that age. I think mine was a blessing from a terrible situation. I was given a gift through my dad passing away. It was like, this is your healing thing and that was it for me if you don't know what you want to do like just go out and experience things you don't have to sit and for example this is another thing this may be controversial but I didn't really go to university I don't feel like I learned most of my real content of my life through a book I learned it from experience so 
if you if you don't know what you want to do but you love being with animals like go and work with animals for a week or a few months if that's not what you want to do in the end then you can take that off and you can try something else I think it's about experiencing things and be open so another thing I think a lot of people have fear about putting themselves out to get rejected throw yourself right in because something I've learned as well unless you ask you will not get and it's something which is so so relevant to my industry as well it's like there are so many of us in this game there are so many singers doing their thing what makes me different to anyone else number one my music and also how I'm going to approach the game like am I shy about asking for what I want now I'm not going to get it like I have to put myself out and I also have to be prepared that I'm going to get a lot of no's more no's than yes but one day it will be a yes and then it will be worth all of the hundreds of no's I got so mm. just dive in and like just experience things. And how do you get to that position of just diving in? Because for many people, it's that tough. that that getting there. It's any, really tough. Any tips that you would? I think suggest? I've always been like a little bit fearless in that half. Mm -hmm. I think I always had it slightly in me where I was like, I'm going to conquer the world. I'm going to make a difference in the world. It was always, and I I think a lot of people looked at me slightly as a joke. They were like, this girl's a bit crazy. I'm not going to lie. Like, the fantasy needs to die down. 12 years later I'm still saying the same thing like I'm going to impact the world and I really will but it might be in a in a in a way which people might not see in a massive banner but I would have changed the people who are in my life their lives in a in a good way and that's enough for me but um I think sometimes you just have to be like what's the worst that can happen what's the worst that can happen if I put myself up for this and I get a no that's the worst that can happen is no like that's just it yeah, you might feel a bit like, oh, like I wish I, I, you know, I got it. But then in my opinion, then that wasn't right for you. There's something better out there for you. So you just got to keep chasing. Keep chasing. So feel the fear and do it anyway. And literally take chances, take risks, experiment. Yeah. yeah, I've got, you know what, one of my tattoos here, it says nothing can hurt us. And it's part of a quote which says nothing can hurt us, only we choose to hurt ourselves. And I, I learned this on a three week therapy course, which I did in the States. And it stuck with me because I was like, out of any situation in your life, good and bad, I'm going to use bad in a situation, like a tough situation. As much as it's so tough, it's, it's about perspective. How do you want to look at it? And I've been through some really tough times, but I will look at it in, in a beautiful way and be like, that was a blessing in its own way. And I'm going to use that in a good way to strive me forward. So, yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's all about perspective. You mentioned therapy, therapeutic retreats yeah. and programs like The Bridge, oh my which you've gosh. been on. Would you like to yeah. expand a little bit on what, it, what yeah. it was and how you experienced being on it? It was just the most incredible course I have ever done. I've done a few different ones. As I said, I did one in the States, which was a three week um, long course. And that was brilliant. But I found The Bridge, which is run by Donna Lancaster, and she is just what a soul she is, number one. Like she, her presence, when she walks into a room, it's like Mother Teresa walking in. It's like, wow, what a woman. And talk about a woman who has conquered hard times. She is a prime example. So I look up already, I hadn't even met her. Or at that point I had many interactions with her. I was like, what a woman to be able to do what she's done. And this course was so amazing because I, I was very stuck to having one-on-one -on -one therapy. And I was a bit nervous about having group therapy because I was just like, it's just going to be a completely different thing. I'm going to be listen, listening to everyone else's problems, taking it all on. And then am I going to feel better towards the end of this? And I remember it was a worry which every single person on the course had. It, we were all worried. We were like, it's going to be quite something to stand up in front of 14 people and talk about your most, like your hardest times. And I'd never done that really in, to that extent before, but it was the most healing thing. I'd, I'm pretty sure the most healing thing I'd ever done. It was, I'm not saying it's better than one-on-one, -on -one. they're both different for me, but to be able to be witnessed by 14 people and have them carry you through your hardest times of you, ex like you're kind of going through that experience again whilst you're talking to them and they're carrying you through it, is just like it is incredible it is incredible and she has done every single part of the course is just like it's just done to 
like perfection. She is so loving. She's so supportive. Um, and yeah, she's just an incredible woman. And did you take away from that some new tools that you 100%. hadn't done before? To be honest with you, it was funny because I had an intention when I walked in. I was like, this is what I want to work on. And then loads of other stuff came up. And I was like, okay, interesting. I didn't know that that was going to come up. This Certain things came up which I hadn't worked on in the past mm -hmm. because I didn't think there were anything really to work on, to be fair. Um, so then I kind of left with the view as to like, you know, these things came up. How am I going to incorporate it into my life for the better? How am I going to work around these things? Um, and I think she, she talks about um, self-love a lot. And that is something, if I'm honest, no ego involved here. It's something I'm working on. It's, re for, it's tough. It's, I think, especially because I'm in an industry which is so, they criticize, criticize, criticize. That is hard to stand there every single day and be like, you know what, not 1% has hurt me. But definitely it hurts. It's some, it does hurt. So I'd be lying if I said to you that my self-love is way up here. Like for me, it's part, in my opinion, it's part of the reason why I'm on earth is to work on that. Is, is to, through my journey of life, is to learn certain um, techniques as to how I can build on my self-love. And it's something I talk about a lot with my friends is if we, if we all come from our true authentic self and express ourselves to each other, no one in my group is going to say, I absolutely love myself. Mm. I think it's rare to come across that. And if you, if you are there, then good, like, wow. Mm. Like, I have a lot of respect for that. And I'm working yeah. towards it. There, of course, there are aspects which I really love. I, I'm, I need to be kind to myself. That's something I've learned. Mm. Is, you know, talk, talk to yourself as if your mother would talk to you. Or a, a loving mother. Or, like, your best friend would talk to you. You wouldn't criticize yourself in that way if you were talking about your best friend or you, you wouldn't speak like that. So that's something I'm really working on. So self more self-kindness work yeah. in progress. It's Did important. you find that there was a conflict between a group residential or group therapeutic experience yeah. and individual therapy? Were you able to continue with your therapist afterwards yes. as well without any... Yeah. They actually recommend actually when you do the course to have a therapist on the other side mm -hmm. and they will they will provide you with therapists or they will like they can link you up if you need one. Um, but I have, as I said, I've had my therapist for years and he had experience with people who'd already done the bridge. So it was easy. He kind of already knew what it would be like potentially for me on the other side. Um, they talk about it's about crossing the bridge. That's how they say it. on the bridge. It's like you cross the bridge. It's like a, it's a development on the other side. Um, so he was prepared. I was very, very emotional for quite a few weeks, maybe for, and to be honest with you, I think if I'm honest, the, the following six months after the course, I was still getting a lot of the stuff, a lot of the emotion was still coming up because how can you possibly pr like really process all of your lifetime's worth of grief in five days? It's just, in my opinion, you can't. So you're gonna, it's gonna leak into months and months and months after, depending on, depending on what sort of person you are or how you heal. It, it's really it's different for each person. And for anyone yeah. watching or listening now, yeah. if they're contemplating therapy, what would you, what would you suggest yeah. to them? I think I've, I've actually put a lot of my friends onto therapy, and there are quite a few of them were people who had not had no idea about therapy. They really thought it was going to be a sit-down conversation, tell me about your problems. That is not my experience of therapy. It's so much more light than that. It's not, it doesn't have to be a heavy experience. So a lot of the time it's like, it's explaining that it doesn't need to be something which is, you don't, also, you don't need to have a traumatic event in your life, in my opinion, to have therapy. A lot of the time, like, I've got a friend who hasn't had really anything, I mean, we all have our own stuff, but hasn't had anything on paper which is traumatic, yet she has got so much out of therapy. So, and that's really telling. So, but I think therapy can be different, it can be different for every person. Like, I know that um, one of my family members, her form of therapy is doing meditation and yoga. That's what works for her. She's tried this sort of therapy and she can't really connect with it. 
So it's about finding what works for you. It's like, this is what works for me and has worked for a few of my friends and a few of my family members, but it might be completely different for someone else. And for those people who are disillusioned or having met a therapist who they didn't necessarily connect or gel with, yeah. what would you advise Don't stop them? there. Mm. Don't stop Continue there. with the same, the same therapist or try someone try else? Try someone else mm -hmm. because I, I also, um, I've never had this experience, but I had, oh, I, this was so crazy for me. I had a friend of mine who went to go and see a therapist. She had never had a therapist before. And number one, the fee she got charged was extortionate. It was like, I was like, who is this person you're seeing? This is crazy. And number two, in the first session, medication was brought up. And I was like, I'm not sure about this already. I mean, like, and, and I had never experienced that myself, but over time of speaking to different friends and different adults, like people generally older than me, they've had so many therapists which they've seen who try to medicate them straight away and they don't understand. And in, in the first hour, how can you possibly try and understand someone's problem to be like, here, take a bunch of pills? It, it doesn't work like that in my view. It's like the pills are gonna numb the pain. They're not gonna help you move through it. So, oh my gosh, I dived in there with that friend. I was like, right, you're going to see my therapist. I was like, you're going to try someone else. And she went to go and see my therapist. She was like, oh my gosh, this is it. This is what people talk about when they love therapy. So if you don't find a therapist which works for you or you don't feel like even in the session, like you're not comfortable, you don't, it's just something's not right, then it's fine. It's just they're not the right therapist for you. Just keep looking. Keep You'll trying. Find someone. Keep yeah, trying. don't stop there. Because that's, yeah. that's kind of like a thing in life. If something doesn't work, mm. you don't just stop there and never do it again. Mm. You have to keep pushing through. And how quickly would you advise someone to move on if, if, they, if they feel that they're not connecting with their therapist? How many sessions yeah. would you advise to it's give a, it? It's a difficult mm. one. I think if you're a very sensitive soul, like for me, I can pick it up within the first five minutes. Even in a, not even with a therapist, with any person, if I'm not feeling them, like I, I would just, I can pick it up so quickly. If you're not sure, then maybe have a few sessions. Don't just tap out on the first one, like ride it out for a few more. And if you're still not sure a few sessions in, then maybe don't drop them, but maybe try someone else and see if it's better with them. And then, but it's, it's a difficult one. So what's on the horizon for you next? You mentioned yeah. Miami. Yeah, so I'm so excited. That's next month, I'm there for two months. Then I've got a show back here in the UK um, I'm working with you guys, which we are, which I have to mention, yes. you, you have kindly helped us launch the Choose Therapy Absolutely. campaign. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, why you were uh, willing to, to help us out with this? Yeah, because as I said to you in the beginning, like therapy has changed my life. And in, as I said, it, I can't say that it would be for everyone because it's different for everyone. But because it has worked so much for me, like, I want to share that with people. I want to work with, with helping people's mental health. You know, it's a tough world we live in. It's really hard. So, like, let's work together to make it a better place. And you know why I love it so much is because I have a tattoo on my arm here. And it says, choose love. So, Nicely choose love, matching. choose therapy. Very well I've got it inked on my and, skin, and so there well we go. Matched. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm so excited. So, I'm recording, then coming back, doing a few shows. Um, and yeah, just going to see what happens. I'm feeling good. It's been wonderful to speak with you today. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing and so openly and honestly delving back into early experiences as well as current challenges and in, in, in career and, and love and, and, and life in general. Really appreciate it. And Thank where you. can people find you? So my name is Amber Donoso. So I'm on Instagram, Facebook. I have an artist page on Facebook. Uh, Spotify, my, my next big singles coming out next month um well maybe I think it probably will be early March now and I've got a video which I'm I absolutely love so that's coming out so it'll be a Spotify Apple Music everywhere YouTube so yeah but I'm so happy I love what you guys are doing I just think it's the world needs it and for us to come together to try and do it together is just the biggest blessing so I have so much respect for what you're doing. You are an incredible woman. Well, I thank you very really much am. for it. And likewise, thank you. Thank you, Amber. Thank you. HarleyTherapy.com is here to help you book counseling with therapists online or in person at the times and prices that suit you wherever you are worldwide.
If this is your first listen to Therapy Lab, do hit subscribe to keep up to date with new episodes. If you feel you'd benefit from therapy and want to transform your life, visit harleytherapy.com to find a therapist anywhere in the UK and worldwide via Skype. We'll see you next time.